Stroke specialists are not expected to be facile in carotid Doppler and transcranial Doppler, which seems ludicrous to me. Because here is a, uh, an entire modality that is very specific to our specialty that is highly effective, uh, repeatable, gives you good information. I think the majority of people who come out of a vascular neurology training have a passing familiarity with it, but it's not a core of their practice. And I think that's something that... Welcome to the StrokeCast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 50 of the StrokeCast. You know, my first day in the hospital was filled with MRIs and CT scans and all sorts of other tests and uh, okay, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration. There was only one MRI, but it seemed like dozens. And there were two CT scans. The The first one, I was just kind of in shock from everything that was going on. And, and the second one, uh, I was just really annoyed at being in there and just not having a great night. So there were only three there, but they were still unpleasant. Plus, they're expensive and you got to go elsewhere in the hospital. You can't just stay in your room which is all you really want to do at a certain point. Well, it turns out there's another option that many neurologists don't even know about. It's called transcranial Doppler ultrasound, and it gives the medical team information that other scans don't. Plus, it involves no radiation or special rooms. Of course, it doesn't replace the other scans altogether, but it does give the doctors another tool for treating stroke patients. Strokecast regular Dr. Narav Shah told me about this lesser-known imaging technique and introduced me to one of its biggest fans in Swedish Medical Center. So, this week, I talk with Dr. Aaron Stamen. Uh, Dr. Stamen is an advocate for and expert in transcranial Doppler ultrasound. And this week, we learn about his background, we talk a little bit uh, about aphasia, but we spend the bulk of our time talking about transcranial Doppler ultrasound. We explore what it is, how it works, and how it benefits patients. You can actually see a short clip of one of these scans over at strokecast.com slash ultrasound. Dr. Aaron Stamen attended medical school at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. He completed an internship in internal medicine and a neurology residency at Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. During his vascular neurology fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, he received specific training in the performance and interpretation of carotid and transcranial ultrasound. He's currently a neurohospitalist at Swedish Medical Center and medical director of the Swedish Cerebrovascular Ultrasound Laboratory. So now, let's meet Dr. Aaron Stamen. So Aaron, thanks so much for joining us here on StrokeCast this week. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we were able to connect. It's, uh, it's always a challenge to coordinate everybody's busy schedules. So when this works out, it's, it's fantastic. Have you always wanted to be a doctor? I had a very long and winding course to where I am now. <laughs> Early on, I thought that's exactly what I should do because I had a, uh, that kind of pedigree as one of those families where... My grandfather is a general surgeon. My father is a surgeon. And uh, so what else am I going to do? <laughs> uh, but I was very fortunate. My father had no expectations that I would do that. In fact, actively encouraged me to seek out other things. He said, this is not the only thing you can do with your life. And uh, if you're going to go to all the effort and expense of doing this, make sure you really want to do it. Make sure it's an actual decision rather than something you do by default. Yes. Uh, but it's easy to get uh, trapped into that that mindset going into medicine. There's a lot of people who, you know, get into their first year of residency after all the pre-med and the medical school, like, wow, what am I doing here? <laughs> and that's, that's a hard realization to have at that point. Mm -hmm. So I I feel lucky that, that there's a long, a large black hole in my resume <laughs> between, <laughs> between college and, uh, and entering medical school that uh, was, was time well spent. But uh, the, 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 short, the short version of that is... Uh, I went to uh, to college, and uh, I planned to be 
you know, a biology major, something like that, something more traditional. And within a semester, uh, I was taking Russian literature courses and uh, playing in the big band. And I ended with uh, a Russian major. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, unsure of what my future would bring there. The job offers aren't flowing in when you have a, <laughs> a bachelor's in, in Russian literature. So I ended up doing the Peace Corps for, uh, for a couple of years. And... Uh, it was during that experience that I gained a different view of medicine. Folks who were taking care of people with tuberculosis in these uh, rural villages who uh, had not received their salaries for nine months wow. were still seeing patients and keeping up in the literature and really genuinely enjoyed what they were doing in spite of the complete lack of remuneration for their services. Right. And that was, that was an inspiration to me. And they were very interesting people and they cared about what they did. They'd get you know, a, a carton of eggs or, you know, some, <laughs> some meat for whatever, were, whatever animal was butchered that day. Right. Uh, and that was, you know, that was their, their life. And they found that very, very gratifying. Uh, and that, that left an impression on me. And I uh, started applying for these post-baccalaureate pre-medical programs after the Peace Corps. Uh, that took a couple of years to pull together because mm -hmm. I had no prerequisites. For <laughs> um, but you can talk all about Dostoevsky. I can talk about Dostoevsky, and I actually worked as a Russian interpreter for uh, for the Russian in Boston, where I oh, did, the, wow. did my uh, pre medical and medical education. There's a very large uh, Russian speaking population, an older generation who is not going to learn English. And so sure, part of my uh, my day job when I was in my studies there was to uh, interpret for the, uh, the Russian speaking patients, which was a lot of fun. And I made a lot of classic mistakes, <laughs> but also got exposed to a lot of different parts of the medical culture, which was good for me uh, to see from the inside as, as, uh, as an observer. And I think that that informed a lot of my decision making as I went forward. Right, right. And as you go ahead and, and choose specialties and, and things like that, and having that translation ability, it seems like you know, over the last 20 years, we have had a lot more Russian immigration into the U.S. So mm -hmm. I met, mentioned that it's turned out to be a valuable skill multiple times. Yeah. Has language affected or given you an advantage in understanding how the brain works by having access to these different languages and by having had to work as a translator, especially since aphasia can be such a, a common complication in stroke? Yeah, uh, I mean, being interested in language and having studied other languages uh, has certainly made the entity aphasia a much more interesting uh, thing to behold and to realize there is a certain way of expressing oneself and bearing oneself and you know, perhaps some effect on how you formulate your ideas as well that is intimately tied up in your, in your language. And when you lose that uh, cultural thread it can become difficult to express that part of, uh, of your identity. One of the things that I find most interesting about language is the, beyond vocabulary and intonation, uh, how much gesture varies from language to language and culture to culture. And frequently what is preserved uh, in aphasia is your ability to maintain facial expression and gesture. And the nonverbal communication, particularly in, in you know, pure motor aphasias that affect your ability to, to phonate and make a symbolic language that's, that's audible, uh, you realize that perhaps more than half of the interactions we have are largely nonverbal. It's intonation if you're making some, some words, if you're completely mute, the facial expressions and the gesture say volumes about, about what's going on internally. I, I often like to tell the story of one of my favorite aphasia patients who had had a a very particular stroke of his left frontal lobe that left him without any expressive language at all. He was able to understand everything and his facial expression and his gesture was completely intact. And that guy had no barriers to his communication. He had very bushy eyebrows as well. And the way he would express himself was, was very, was very <laughs> profound. And the only word I ever heard him say, <laughs> I, I uh, was showing him different objects in the room and saying, can you name this? Can you name this? Can you name this? And as the final object, he wasn't able to name any of them. He just kind of looked at it. And he knew what it was, and he just shake his head. And finally, I sh I showed him my wedding ring, uh -huh. and I pointed to that. I said, "What's this?" And he thought really hard. He pointed it, and he said, "Trouble." <laughs> 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 
<laughs> was he trying to be funny? <laughs> he could that 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 guy. I, I saw him several times yeah. in my clinic, and he had no no problem cutting it up and making me laugh without oh. saying a single word. Awesome. Um, but that's you know through my experiences with language and being really bad at language on the front end of it, and realizing how much you can make yourself understood with, mm-hmm. with inference and with intonation and with gesture and how much uh, people who've lost their symbolic language are able to make themselves perfectly well understood without that. I think that's an important, important concept to, uh, to internalize as a neurologist, that uh, spoken language is only one bit of communication. It's only one component in the whole system. But to answer your question, I think there are very specific things about different language subtypes I don't know if they necessarily affect one's one's recovery or one the effect of one's uh, stroke, but there are certainly, you know, certain linguistic subgroups that are much more gesture heavy. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if they have, you know, better resiliency after after stroke. All this stuff is really fascinating. And why do, you know you got this exposure as a translator to all these different specialties mm-hmm. and all these different fields? So yeah. why neurology? Your first hint of neurology in, in medical school is, is the, the neuroscience uh, course, uh, which is, is a very polarizing thing. It's really complicated, uh, learning, learning these pathways and learning all the different functional areas of the, the brain. And everyone's one of these, these exams everyone dreads. And so there are people who are really po- polarized against the nervous system and those who are polarized, this is great. Mm-hmm. One of the things you have to reconcile, though, is that as much as you may love neuroscience and neuroanatomy, the actual practice of being a neurologist is is uh, is different than that. Because as much as we understand about the anatomy and the physiology of the nervous system, uh, our ability to uh, affect recovery and prevent prevent damage lag way behind that anatomical and uh, physiologic knowledge, I think, to, to a much more profound extent than in the gastrointestinal system or the, you know, the, the pulmonary system. And so that's, that's a, a frustration you have, to, you have to square with. There's also a very traditional view that uh, neurologists are really great at diagnosing things and they're no good at treating things. And that was always a, a notion that, uh, uh, that bothered me and I thought, this is the reason I won't be able to do neurology. When you get into clinical neurology and your rotations, you realize that we treat all kinds of things. And the rapidity with which uh, we're getting better at things like stroke, which, which even, you know, the early part of my training, I was, I was like, well, you know, you just give them an aspirin and see what happens. You know, that was like the extent of, of stroke management, you know, in a, simpl- in a simplified version given to me you know, by people who were going to other specialties. Like this was not something to pursue because it was a dead end. Sure. Uh, and as you and I both know, in the last you know t- twenty five years, it's 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 anything but. Right. What really attracted me to it was this combination of a great deal of accelerating innovation, innovation about the the management of things like stroke, management of things like multiple sclerosis, which has been huge leaps there as well. Epilepsy has more medications than, than <laughs> most other conditions that we have in our our specialty. Um, you know, deep brain stimulation was coming in for tremor and Parkinsonian disorders. And so it was a field that seemed to be on the brink of having a lot to offer in terms of making people better. It had fascinating technologies for imaging both the brain and the blood vessels that provide nutrients and oxygen to the, to the brain and to the spinal cord. And that, I kind of fell in love visually uh, with that, uh, that part of it. But the thing that was the, uh, the, the hook for me was he had all this newfangled stuff, all this technology, all this innovation, but most of what you did was still the same little leather bag of tools that they had back in the 19th century. And you could still make the bulk of your diagnoses based upon what you had in your little bag and talking to the patient. And so I thought it was this really cool kind of anachronistic specialty where you could still have your reflex hammer and something sharp to poke somebody with, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a uh, a handheld ophthalmoscope, and uh, you could still do a lot of neurology and make diagnoses. But you also had this completely new set of tools uh, at your disposal as well. And I really liked that idea of being a hands-on, old-fashioned 
you know, tweed wearing neurologist <laughs> and uh, being somebody who could also interpret, you know, complicated images and then have a, an array of, uh, of, of tools that were treatment tools that we, we didn't have before. You know, that, that's interesting thinking about it simultaneously as perhaps the most advanced and the most retro of the medical specialties. Yeah. <laughs> so with, within neurology, you've mentioned getting into the imaging and the visualizations and starting to see how that goes. And uh, so your specialty, as I understand it, is in sonography, which I, I you know, the, the writer in me likes the idea that, uh, you know, you're talking about the beauty of something you do with sound mm -hmm. <laughs> in that. So can you tell us a little bit about that field? Because I think most all of, most of us never know about ultrasound is, you know, are you pregnant or not? Right. And stroke survivors probably know a little bit more that, so do you have a hole in your heart or do you not? Right. But beyond that, that first day where we're going through MRIs and CAT scans and people with magnifying glasses, that's yeah. all a blur for most of us. Yeah. Um, it, it is uh, still in many places in this country kind of an orphaned modality for, for diagnostics. Uh, and I'm, I will what admit, do you mean by that? I'll admit to you, I think... Uh, it does. It does not have a lot of uh, advocates okay. out there in the neurology world. Uh, it is, you know, been it's it's been well developed. It has good data to say it can it can provide good diagnostic uh, information for secondary prevention of stroke. But I think there's a overall lack of understanding of the modality, and there's not a lot of teaching of it. And to be quite frank. It was very late in my training that I even came upon it. I knew of it as a modality uh, in neurology for looking at the neck arteries, mainly at the carotid arteries, uh, to decide if someone had a degree of narrowing in that vessel that warranted an operation, either placement of a stent or carotid endarterectomy, where they remove the plaque with an open procedure in order to prevent stroke down the road in someone who had had a transient ischemic attack or a stroke already. Uh, but beyond that, it was as a modality, I didn't think had a, a, a huge role. And then when I was in residency, uh, one of the, uh, if, a, if a hospital has transcranial Doppler, which is the version where you use the thin parts of the bone and the skull and the, the temporal bone in front of the ear, you can actually see the major arteries at the base of the skull in about 90% of patients. Uh, you can get enough sound energy through there to actually get the Doppler signal of that bulk flow of red blood cells moving away from you or toward you, depending upon the orientation of the vessel. So that's basically like taking that wand we may see on TV for mm -hmm. uh, looking at, uh, at at fetuses and using that and applying that to the temple to get an image of what's happening in the brain. That's right. You can look through the, the temple and you can see the middle cerebral artery, you can see the anterior cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery. If you look through the eyeball, through the orbit, you can see the carotid siphon, which is the end of the carotid artery as it comes up into the skull base. Uh, and you can also see the ophthalmic artery, which comes off of that artery and provides blood flow to the, to the retina. If you look through the back of the skull, uh, and the frame and magnum with the spinal cord comes in the back of the skull, uh, you can also see the two vertebral arteries uh, that make up the posterior circulation, and they combine to form the basilar artery at the back. The eyeball <laughs> window and the frame and magnum window at the back of the, the head... Um, are the reliable ones. Temporal windows, there's 10 to 15% of the population, their skull is literally too thick. And I have to tell them <laughs> we're talking in literal terms, not figurative terms. Sure. Many people have a thick skull. These people actually have thick skulls. That limits us. That, that's a limitation of the modality. Anyway, I'd never encountered it before mm -hmm. I went to residency. And uh, it's, it's common if, the, if you have a technologist who is skilled at, at using transcranial Doppler, the most common way they use it is for people who've had hemorrhages, a specific type of hemorrhage called a subarachnoid hemorrhage when you have an aneurysm that ruptures in the brain. And these patients can have a complication uh, known as vasospasm. And so the presence of blood in the subarachnoid space around the brain causes the smooth muscle in these big vessels and the smaller vessels uh, out toward the, uh, the edge of the brain to, to constrict and that can be so bad it can actually cause strokes as a secondary phenomenon in the uh, days to weeks that follow this. Institutions that had this available would several times a week would, would look at the velocities in those big vessels at the base of the skull. If there's a trend toward them going up, they could intervene uh, with uh, 
catheter angiogram. They put catheters up into the carotid arteries and actually uh, infuse vasodilators, try to stave off the uh, vasospasm. And a vasodilator is something that basically opens up the blood vessels more? Correct. So I saw it there and you'd see a technologist, you know, in the neurological ICU going around seeing these patients. And I always thought it was kind of a novelty item. Mm -hmm. I never thought that it had a wider role in the treatment of ischemic stroke. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really only when I got to my fellowship at uh, at Emory down in Mm -hmm. Atlanta, uh, where I had a a mentor who was uh, an aficionado of uh, transcranial Doppler and uh, taught me how to do this, to perform the studies, taught me how to interpret them, and gave me the, the, the full spectrum of what the modality could offer. And I was shocked. I had no idea that, mm-hmm. uh, that it was capable of doing all these different things to a level approaching, you know, as good as MR angiogram and CT angiogram, the kind of things we, we do routinely in all our patients. Right. And, and it ha- seems like it has the added advantage of, I mean, the problem with the CT scan is that you know, there's some limited resolution issues mm-hmm. and it's radiation. So if a patient already gets a ton of x-rays for whatever reason, you don't necessarily want to do that. Yeah. Or an MRI, which, you know, can give you some amazing results. But if the patient has any metal in them, whether from jewelry you can't mm-hmm. remove or shrapnel or anything like that, you can't send them an MRI. Or if they have like a metal mesh uh, from another surgical procedure, MRI isn't an option. Yeah. So th- that's the times that I thought it was appropriate to use ultrasound mm-hmm. was when you couldn't use one of the others because someone has an iodine contrast allergy so you can't do a CT angiogram or someone has uh, a pacemaker that isn't compatible with the magnet so you can't do an MR angiogram. But what I've learned is that in many cases, the transcranial Doppler and carotid ultrasound of the neck are perfectly adequate to do a stroke workup in probably the majority of people. Mm-hmm. We'll give you the information you need. There are certain segments that you cannot uh, get sound energy to well enough to see that you need another modality for. It is much more a modality based upon hemodynamics and the velocity of the blood flow rather than visualizing the inside of the pipe. Okay. People like MRA and CTAs, it looks like the anatomy textbooks. <laughs> right. It gives, you, it gives you the whole tree, whereas the Doppler is giving you little segments and it's showing you kind of a grainy looking picture, kind of like, you know, the, the, the obstetrical, you know, ultrasound pictures where it's kind of looks like a baby, but it's kind of freaky looking. Yeah. Too. Uh, and so you think, get things that look like a vessel that show you blood flow, but it does not look as pretty as a CT angiogram that's been reconstructed or an MR angiogram does. But it also gives you information those other studies don't. And so I've gained an understanding that, whereas for a lot of people, it's the only modality you can use. Some people, it's a perfectly reasonable modality. They can replace the others. It's cheaper, has no radiation, doesn't have, uh, you know, the limitations of the, the magnet. Um, Sounds like it's something you can just wheel into a patient's room instead of bringing the patient to a dedicated very space. Very portable and it's repeatable, which is a thing that the other, the other modalities, it's tougher. You know, if someone has borderline kidney functions, you want to be getting CT angiograms every few days if they have a dynamic exam going on. Whereas ultrasound, you can do it five times a day and that sound and energy is is not at a at a level that's going to be harmful to them, and you can actually see a dynamic process, you know, going on. The the thing that ultrasound can show you that MRA and CT angiogram do not, if you're looking at the vessel specifically, mm-hmm. is the actual waveforms and the dynamics. A CT angiogram will show you that contrast is getting to that vessel at some given time, but it doesn't tell you how it gets there. It doesn't okay. Tell you the direction of the flow does not tell you the velocity of the flow. Okay. And so there may be uh, a basilar artery that's reversed because the two vertebral arteries are so blocked off that it actually has to reverse its flow and get recruit blood flow from the, the carotid circulation forward uh, through communicating vessels at the base of the skull. And a CTA will show you that blood's getting to the, to the basilar artery, but you can't tell if it's getting there the traditional way through very tight tight narrowings in the vertebral arteries or whether it's coming the opposite way. And the vertebral and the, um, excuse me, the uh, transcranial Doppler will show you that the blood flow is in fact reversed. Uh, and then none of those other modalities will give you direction. It's, it's kind of like in math class where the teacher said, you know, you could get the answer, but you wouldn't get the points because you didn't show your work. <laughs> transcranial Doppler shows the work that the blood vessels are doing to feed the brain. That's correct. 
That's correct. And there's other things about the uh, the blood flow that you can interpret from the the waveforms and the Doppler that you can't get from the other ones. Uh, you can see how asymmetric the flow is between one middle cerebral artery versus the other. If there's a dissection of an artery, there's an occlusion of an artery, there's a severe narrowing, those waveforms look very, very different. They get blunted on the one side and the uh, there's compensatory flow. You'll see that the other side of the brain is actually trying to shift blood flow across a communicator at the at the center of the brain, uh, a place called the anterior communicating artery, to help so the left side can help the right if there's a bad stenosis or narrowing on the right carotid artery. So all those questions, steel phenomena, where part of the brain are, or the arm, in the case of subclavian steel phenomena, where you have the arm actually stealing blood flow from the back part of the brain uh, by reversing one of the vertebral arteries. That's a diagnosis you can really only make with Doppler. You need to know about the direction of flow. And you can do physiologic tests like putting a blood pressure cuff on the arm and cutting off the circulation for three minutes. And then you let it go and you get that awful pins and needles feeling in your arm. Uh -huh. But it also creates a demand in the arm that will, that will increase the steel phenomenon from the brainstem uh, when that vertebral artery reverses. And so you can do physiologic challenges to the system and see how it changes while you've got the probe on there which the other modalities can't show you either. Right. Which is really exciting if you're trying to figure out, is this actually something that's an that's a incidental finding or is this something that actually is causing the symptoms you're experiencing? And so Doppler has a unique ability to allow you to monitor what's going on and make a change in the system to see if, it, uh, if the system can't compensate for it. That's really interesting because, you know, we, you know, obviously stroke is generally, you know, it's a clot or it's a burst. But ultimately, it's part of the brain. It's not getting the blood it's supposed to get from something from something else. And the Doppler will show you it's possible your brain could be starved because something else is stealing mm -hmm. stealing the blood. And this will show you that. Correct. Correct. That's that's really interesting. I had never I had never really heard of that. That I also think it's fascinating how the brain is now shifting blood from one side to the other to take over. It's kind of like. Uh, when they're doing emergency repairs on the uh, on the Enterprise and diverting mm -hmm. power from the shields to life support yes. or whatever. The brain is doing that with blood. Yes. That's exactly how I like to think of it as well. I use I often use the analogy of, you know, sometimes I five gets blocked up and you gotta like, you know, you, you know, use ninety nine or you gotta use yeah. four or five. Yeah. And those those may get more efficient over time as mm -hmm. we make improvements. And the brain gets makes improvements in its collateral circulation as well. But at the immediate point of obstruction, it's got to figure out another plan. And the brain is actually exquisitely good at doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it falls apart in situations where the occlusion is simply too big to, to adapt. So as, as all of this is growing, as there is starting to be a little bit more awareness of this. What are you most excited about in the innovations coming in in transcranial Doppler? One of the things that I'm excited about is the uh, technology that's allowing for a operator independent transcranial Doppler. So one of the things that has limited a more widespread use is that it's really hard to train a technologist to do these studies. Finding the temporal windows, finding the vessels, and having enough anatomical know-how to interpret what you're doing real time. And then, well, gee, if this one's got such blunted flow here, I need to check and make sure this other vessel is not been reversed to compensate for it. So all these technologists are not only following a protocol, but they're interpreting the data as they're getting it and then making decisions about how they're going to do the rest of their study in order to give the interpreting physician like me the, the information they want. And the group we have here, we have six technologists who are all fantastic. Uh, and they are probably as good at interpreting these studies as they are at collecting the raw data. But it's really hard to make an ultrasound technologist who specializes in transcranial Doppler and carotid Doppler. And that's been a barrier for a lot of places to invest in the equipment and the technology because it's, it's, it's hard to find technologists who has that specialization to do it well, to get useful data. Because it's not just you can put a list of these are the 30 points you need to hit to hold it at this angle at this point to get this image. Mm -hmm. You have to do the live interpretation, unlike other organs, which you know, more stay in place. What we were talking about with uh, neurology earlier, stuff moves around, relocates. You have to be able to interpret that too. Yeah. Yeah. And understand all the different anatomical variants that, that can happen in the, uh, the intracranial circulation. 
it really takes a very sophisticated technologist to, to get to, to utilize the, the technology well. So there's uh, in development now a robotic version that is uh, technologist independent that can find all these windows and get at least the basic uh, waveforms for the major arteries at the base of the, the skull through that, that temporal window. And eventually that'll be developed into getting the, the posterior window I talked about through the back of the skull and through the, uh, the orbits as well. That will suddenly make this much more widely available to, you know, to a community hospital versus just like a big you know, tertiary medical center like, like Swedish or Harborview where, where this is uh, available. And I think once the technology is more far reaching, I think the spectrum of things that it, it can do, I think will be, will be harnessed by those who, uh, who, who, are, who are treating patients with, with stroke. So that's, that's, that's an important innovation. I think it'll make, make it a much more uh, realizable modality for, you know, across the country institutions. Right now, I mean, I can, I mean, the volume we do here, there's probably a handful of, of hospitals nationwide who do as much transcranial Doppler as we do. And so in terms of pushing the, uh, the field forward and doing research, when there's that few places doing it, it's just hard to get the numbers right. uh, to show that this is useful, that using this modality is, is changing outcomes and making people better and, and demonstrating an advantage. Not even an advantage. I think demonstrating that it's complementary, complementary to those other imaging modalities. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the combination of CT angiogram and Doppler. I think the two of those things together is a very, very powerful uh, imaging modality. Because you get pretty pictures with the CTA and you get information about what the blood's doing with the transcranial Doppler. And you can, the transcranial Doppler, not only can you repeat it every day, do it multiple times a day, you can take it in the OR, you can take it in the patient's room, you can take it to the ICU. So we monitor people who are getting these uh, transluminal aortic valve replacements Mm -hmm. where instead of opening up the chest, they're going through, you know, a a vessel in the groin or a, uh, or going through the carotid here and seeing what happens in the brain circulation while you're doing those procedures. And it's, it's, it's interesting to, to gather that information and, and, and see it, that there's air bubbles that are getting in there, that there are, you know, there are bits of plaque from the aorta that, that break off. We know these things are happening, sure. but to be able to quantify it and say, is this, is this having an effect on cognition or function you know, later on? I think it's useful data to have. And, and does this, is this technology that can also be used simultaneously with mechanical thrombectomy to help guide that process along? The catheter angiogram is the gold standard okay. for all these modalities because it shows you direction of flow. It shows you how blood gets there. It's, it's basically a movie of blood running through the brain from the arterial side through the tissue to the venous side and coming back, back out again down to the heart. And that's like kind of the, the, the thing we're all trying to achieve, mm-hmm. we know, with multi-phase CTA where you're getting like different snapshots of that movie or there's, uh, there's, there's flow MRA where you can kind of get direction as well. They're all trying to, to gain that, that gold standard view of really the best temporal resolution, the best spatial resolution is that catheter angiogram. I'm not sure that real time during thrombectomy, there's an advantage that the TCD okay. will give you. We do use it after thrombectomy, though, because what we've learned is that reocclusion of that vessel is a thing that can happen. And reocclusion is another clot forming in the same spot. In the same spot, particularly if there's something below that clot, like a plaque in the vessel, that's still a surface that can make platelets aggregate together and, and form a new, a new clot. And one of the things we do with, with uh, Doppler after a thrombectomy is we look to see if there are what we call high-intensity transients or microembolic signals. When you see a waveform that's created by the Doppler uh, effect of this bulk flow of red blood cells, uh, you see uh, what looks like a set of ocean waves that, that, that follow the cardiac cycle going across the screen. And if you have the sound on, you hear, <laughs> uh, and that's the, the blood flow going through that, the artery that you're, that you're insinating. But if you have something that's much bigger than a red blood cell fly by, it makes a very different signal that goes, huh. or a chirp. Uh-huh. And you can see it as a stripe that follows through the waveform, but it kind of curves because it follows time as well as it goes further out the artery. And so there's, there's very specific visual and audio features of these things that are embolic. And whether it's a piece of clot, a piece of plaque, 
or a piece of, or a, an air bubble, mm-hmm. it'll make that same. This needs to be a lot bigger than a red blood cell, right? To make that uh, that signal, and so we know it's that when it's like how I can sort of see background noise on audio waveforms while I'm editing. Exactly, exactly. But there's there's certain things that are much that create a much bigger signal and stand out from that background. Right. And so if you're seeing that, uh, if someone has a clot. Uh, retrieved using one of these uh, stent retrievers from a left middle cerebral artery, we can then put the ultrasound probe on a, on a headband around the head, have it sit on there for 30 minutes at a spot a little downstream from there. And if we see that there's tons of these embolic signatures, then there's probably been some disruption of the inside of the vessel. After all, we're, we're taking a stent, opening it up, and then dragging it out of there with the clot. Right. So the notion that we're not causing some micro damage to that vessel is probably being too generous to ourselves. And is that is that what's going to cause a reocclusion or the formation of a new clot? That's certainly a concern. And so in trying to risk stratify people who may be at higher risk for occlusion or sending out a new traveling clot from that same area, we use this modality to try to help us guide our blood thinning therapy. Mm-hmm. Frequently people have re- already received the clot busting medication, Alteplase or IVTPA, and there's a, a protocol we still follow that says no aspirin, <laughs> you know, no heparin or any blood thinners after that because of the bleeding risk. Sure. But when we see patients who've had a thrombectomy after their clot busting agent that was given through the IV and they have lots of microembolic signatures, we're worried that that's a high risk area. Sure. We know that the TPA has already moved on. It's been cleared from, from the system. And although there's a theoretical risk of bleeding, these are patients we, we may decide, like, I think it really makes more sense to have something that's going to keep the platelets from binding together. Or in a situation where we think there's already clot there, we'll, we'll start something like a heparin drip to keep it from propagating. And this gives you the more, more data to make the, the right decision in terms of balancing uh, patient safety and the risks of uh, blood thinning versus the risks and odds of another, uh, another stroke happening. Correct. And if you see there's, you know, in a course of 30 minutes, there was 20 of these microembolic signatures, you make a change, uh, you know, you start them on aspirin, you load them with Plavix, or you start them on a heparin drip, and you check your TCD again, your transcranial Doppler in six hours. If all the signatures are gone now, you also have a biomarker that, that you've achieved the, the clinical effect that you're going for as mm-hmm. well. And so the repeatability and the safety of the modality becomes really simple because Doing, you know, eight catheter angiograms in a week on a patient is not safe to do. Right. Uh, it's a very invasive test. And, you know, although it has a good safety profile in, in good hands, uh, you know, even a less than 1% risk of causing a stroke, if you do it enough times, that that, that adds up. Exactly. Exactly. If it's a one in a, one in a hundred risk and you do it a hundred times. Right. Then the data is not, not friendly to you. What's really interesting is the idea of having it as a headband or putting it into a hat or even a helmet to give yes. you some ongoing monitoring in a very safe way is like, that's just an awesome innovation. It's a really cool innovation. I think that's why with the, uh, the, the robot, you know, this, this opens us up to having something that's, that's a, that's a autonomous, not autonomous, not self-aware, like, you know, <laughs> not the Terminator or anything, but like something that you can put on that, that, that is, that is truly operated independent that in an ambulance, you put on the head and look, while they're coming, you know, three hours from the peninsula because they, you know, they can't fly because the, you know, the weather is no good for the helicopter or the, or the plane, we can get data while they're en route about what's going on there. We gave them TPA. Did they recanalize on their own? How are they getting blood flow there? Do they have, are they harnessing those other non-I-5 uh, roadways to get blood flow to that part of the brain? The, the horizon is, is very exciting looking to me uh-huh. with, with this technology. Another... A thing that has not panned out yet. We know that you, if, if you apply the same ultrasound frequency that we use for diagnostics uh-huh. to a clot in vitro in a, in a, in a petri dish uh-huh. with TPA, there's much higher rates of dissolving that clot apart. Similar concept to how they break apart kidney stones with, with sound waves? Yes. I think the idea here is more that you separate out the uh, fibrous components of the clot. You get more of that, uh, the agent delivered. Okay. into the clot. Theoretically, that, that's, that, that's how it works. But that one of, one of my mentors and, and teachers, Dr. Andre Alexandrov, took it a step further and said, well, what if we use this as a therapeutic modality? Mm-hmm. So people who are getting IV TPA will put this helmet on them 
that has an array of probes that are all pointing in the directions of the major vessels in the uh, skull, we'll see if people are getting ultrasound in addition to Alteplase, the clot busting medication, do they have a higher rates of, of opening up the clots and better recovery, you know, at three months out, which is sort of the typical endpoint for a lot of these uh, stroke trials. And the the answer is so far is there hasn't been a difference. Okay. But, you know, that, that technology is going to be reworked as well. Mm-hmm. And even if that, the therapeutic part doesn't pan out, the helmet itself, I think, is still a fascinating thing mm-hmm. that will allow us to get data uh, remotely, operator independent, uh, that we can use for a process that we know is very dynamic. You know, we think of it as like, oh, wow, they showed up with like the clot in this place. We send them down here. And that three hours, we know all different kinds of things can happen. It can open up on its own. It can migrate uh, uh-huh. downstream to another part. The, uh, the collaterals can also improve as time goes on. Mm-hmm. The idea of having something that's non-invasive, that's safe, and give us real-time information about a highly dynamic process, I think is, is really exciting. I mean, what do you wish more doctors and, and, and other physicians knew about this technology? Sadly, I wish many knew about its existence and its as transcranial. Sure. I've certainly had the, uh, the, the comment back from those who've consulted me saying, uh, transcranial what? Or what, what's a TCD? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's not something that's available everywhere. Depending on where you train, you might have had zero exposure to it. Mm-hmm. And that's completely understandable. That's not anyone's fault, but the fault of, perhaps the fault of, of neurology that at least I think we should do a better job training our our new generation of neurologists, particularly stroke neurologists. It's expected that neurologists who are epilepsy specialists know how to read an electroencephalogram, voltages made by the surface of the brain that show you if someone has a tendency toward, toward a seizure disorder or not. If you're a neuromuscular specialist, they expect you to be able to do a nachomyogram and, and put little uh, needles into the muscles, have you activate them and diagnose muscle and nerve problems that way. Stroke specialists are not expected to be facile in carotid Doppler and transcranial Doppler, which seems ludicrous to me. Because here is a, uh, an entire modality that is very specific to our specialty that is highly effective, repeatable, gives you good information. But I think the majority of people who come out of a vascular neurology training uh, have a passing familiarity with it, but is not a core of their practice. And I think that's something that I would like to change within neurology, that that is a core competence that someone who goes into stroke neurology should have. Because uh, I think the, the education uh, will get better for our colleagues who are non-neurologists through us just being more comfortable with the modality ourselves. Because I find that when I talk to you know, a cardiothoracic surgeon who says, this guy uh, needs a new aortic valve. We did a uh, carotid Doppler before the, uh, the surgery, and they've got a 90% narrowing on the side. Never had a stroke or TIA before. Do we need to do something about this before we, we do the surgery? And they're going to put them on a bypass and have a, you know, a potentially low flow state. And is that, is that hemisphere at risk? And what I like to do now is one of these functional studies, kind of like with the, the, the steel phenomenon mm-hmm. I was talking about before, where we put the headband on, we find the the middle cerebral arteries, which are the major arteries at the base of the skull for either hemisphere. And we uh, set the probes, inserting those waveforms on both sides. We have two channels on the screen so you can see what each side looks like. See what that looks like with breathing normal room air. Then you have them breathe a high concentration of, of carbon dioxide. Mm-hmm. And carbon dioxide, turns out, uh, is a very powerful vasodilator. Okay. So what happens is that the good side, you'll see an increase in the, in the fl- flow velocities in that side uh, because all the little tiny arterioles at the end of that vessel tree are going to dilate. The resistance goes down, the velocity in the vessel that you're They're looking like at is going to go up. Stretching open, screaming, give me oxygen. <laughs> Well, they're, they're responding to that, that, that the carbon dioxide is just a very, there's oxygen in this mix too. Right. right. But uh, that happens to be a very powerful uh, uh, manipulator of the, of the system. What it shows us is what, where the reserve is. Because if the other side doesn't budge with the CO2, we know it's already doing everything it can mm. to try to preserve blood flow there. And with this challenge with the, the CO2, it can't do any more. We know that that side is exhausted. Mm-hmm. And those are the people I worry about being on on bypass, cardiopulmonary bypass, you have a low flow state in a system that's already suffering 
and doesn't have any reserve. Where someone has that 90% narrowing of their carotid artery, uh, but they've had it for years and it's never caused a problem, they may have velocities that symmetrically increase because they've already figured the brain's figured out a way to do it. Right. And I can tell I can tell that cardiothoracic surgeon, I think it's going to be fine mm-hmm. to do it without that. And I've done a functional test. I've not just done a standard, this is what the vessel looks like right now. Sure. This is what if you challenge this system, this side can't handle it. It's going to be in trouble. And they can say, we need to fix that that neck vessel before we fix the valve. Right. And when I tell that to a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon who doesn't know anything about TCD, they get really excited about it. It's like, wow, that's a really powerful way to give me the information I'm asking you. Mm-hmm. And it's fun for me to see another doctor get excited about what I do. He says, that's really helpful. Right. That's giving me the information I want to know. And it's simple. You can do it right now. It takes, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And I have an answer mm-hmm. about what we should do next, mm-hmm. uh, whether to do another extra surgery or not, you know, that, that has, you know, its own procedural risks and someone who's already sick from a cardiac issue. And I think that that's really powerful information that this little probe, this little thing that it sits on a cart can do for us. But I think a lot of people don't know about it. And my major problem is people who should know about it don't know about it. And so that's where I'd like to start first, you know, in my career as a, as a, a stroke neurologist, as an educator. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's one of the things we do here at Swedish is we have a, uh, an annual symposium where we invite people who are neurologists, who are radiologists, uh, neurosurgeons to come and learn about how we use transcranial Doppler. And then my favorite thing is to go through three hours of my favorite cases where TCD has shown me something really exciting Uh to change the management. And that's that's really fun to share with people and people get excited about it. Sure. They take it back to their institutions like, we want to have a TCD lab too. Right. And that's fun. But uh, that's the kind of citizen's diplomacy I'm doing right now. It's kind of going back to my Peace Corps days. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and it's one more reason why if you got to have a stroke, Seattle's not a bad place to do it. <laughs> don't, if you can get away with it, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but that's awesome. So if folks want to learn more about transcranial Doppler, mm-hmm. where should they go? What should they uh, look for? The uh, uh, American Society of Neuroimaging uh, is a great resource for literature about transcranial Doppler and carotid Doppler, and also about if you're interested in becoming certified, they do the exam, they tell you what you need to, to get in order to get there, uh, and also what's going on in terms of current research. So Aaron, thank you so much for joining us this week. This has been, this has been fascinating. I had no idea there was so much of this involved and really just what this was, what all this was involved with, and the potential is really fantastic. It's really exciting. We're, we're, we're super enthusiastic about it. It makes my job a lot of fun and it makes me excited about, uh, about the future. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to talk with me. And that brings us to our hack of the week. This week's tip comes from Twitter user at nursery1994, also known as Abigail Johnson. Earlier this week, I was thinking about making pasta. Now, my girlfriend rightly pointed out that I'll also then need to figure out how to drain the boiling water from the pasta with my one hand without spilling it and the water all over myself and the kitchen floor. Uh, Before we completed this particular problem-solving exercise, she just went ahead and made it because she's awesome like that. Later on, I stumbled across a strategy on Twitter. Put a colander or wire strainer that you can lift with one hand into the pot ahead of time. Then fill the pot with water and add the pasta to the strainer before cooking it. Then boil or whatever it is you're going to do. And when it's done, just lift out the strainer with the pasta and leave the water behind to cool. And then you can always dump it when it's safer later on. You know. Basically the way to make French fries at a McDonald's. Before we wrap up today, I do want to share one more update. StrokeCast does have a presence on Facebook. Just search for StrokeCast the next time you're on Facebook for more videos where I share stroke-related things that just happen to be on my mind. Sometimes they are well thought out. Sometimes they're still just, you know, thoughts in process. But it's fun stuff regardless. Uh, I've talked about sleep and neuro fatigue and goals for the year and just all sorts of other things that just come to mind and maybe a little bit less polished than one of these episodes. So when you're done here, head on over to Facebook and search for Stroke Guest to check it out. 
It took a few tries for Aaron and I to connect to talk about ultrasound. One of the challenges with meeting with a neurologist is that you never know when they're going to have to cancel so they can go do something like, oh, I don't know, save a life. But I'm glad we did connect. I enjoyed chatting with him about language and aphasia and the nature of a foreign language. And I, and that was all just really fascinating to me. And I was completely unaware of just how powerful and innovative transcranial Doppler ultrasound can be for stroke treatment. In this conversation, I also learned things like blood flows backwards sometimes because it's needed elsewhere. I had no idea the body did that. And I learned that the brain redirects blood from one side to the other when needed, like Scotty, Jordy, Balana, O'Brien, or Trip do on their various Starfleet vessels. And I especially appreciated Aaron's enthusiasm for this technology. I'd love to hear about your experience with stroke imaging. Which scans did you get? And did you get a transcranial Doppler ultrasound? Let us know in the comments over at strokecast.com slash ultrasound. Next time you're talking to your medical team, ask if they use transcranial Doppler ultrasound in their stroke treatment. If they'd like to know more about it, go ahead and give them the link strokecast.com slash ultrasound. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Strokecast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.